my questions originally for the interview were the, the typed ones, and all my notes are <laughs> <laughs> from today are everything. I couldn't keep up with you. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I'm like, as soon as I write an idea, I'm hearing another one that goes, that's so juicy. I'm going, oh my God. Um, the tape is rolling. So, yeah, I wanted to start with uh, you personally, mm -hmm. and I'm really curious who mentored you and who initiated <laughs> you. Well, I don't know about initiated. Um, you know, when I've thought about it, and I've had to think about it because, um, like I was saying to the group today, um, where we have been mentored awakens parts of ourselves, and it's good to know one's own mentoring background or history. And I think the first mentoring I experienced was from older guys in the neighborhood. Well, actually, I have to back up even one more. I talk about mentoring moments because that's how a lot of it went for me. And one of the bigger moments in my young life was a teacher, um, a nun. I had I went to Catholic grammar school, and I had nuns. And mostly that wasn't so good, but um, one of the nuns, who was a very young woman and very new to being a nun, uh, so that would have been, I think, sixth grade, uh, really helped me out. She really saw something in me that I wasn't clear about at all and, and just named it and, and kind of uh, made a point of celebrating it because I was a, an enigma for the teachers. I would have often the highest grades or close to the highest grades, but I was always in trouble. I was like a wise guy with good grades, which wasn't supposed to happen. It was supposed to be two separate groups. and. Uh, and she somehow spotted what that was about and figured that out. And uh, so that was an early mentor. And she did a startling thing. She, she told the class that the way they had the class set up is uh, the high, people with the highest grades sat in the front and then everybody descended. Uh, and so if you were, it was that bad. If you were sitting at the, all the way at the back, it meant one of two things. You had the lowest grades or you had done something bad. And so she said, well, I have a problem because we have one student who should be all the way at the back for behavior and all the way at the front for performance. And she said, so um, I've been advised, she was very young, I've been advised to put him at the back. She said, but it doesn't feel right to me. She said, I was raised with five brothers and I wouldn't put them at the back. So, so I'm gonna put him at the front and I want you to understand that, <laughs> this was stunning, I remember it now, she said, Michael is either going to be a leader for the good or the leader, a leader for the bad. And we're going to put him in the front and all pray that he becomes a leader for the good. <laughs> and she stunned me, you know, this is in front of the whole class. And it was so, what would you call that, psychological and, and alert? And uh, she was a sweetheart. And uh, she followed that actually by, she began to weep about her brothers. And she took her habit off. It was a stunning thing. She, you know, uh, you see nuns and they have that thing on. She took the, the uh, habit off and she had a shaved head. Here was this, she was probably in her 20s, early 20s. And she just began to cry in front of everybody. And she said, I miss my brothers and I'm not sure if I've done the right thing. And, and I have to wear this and, and all this stuff. So anyway, it was all woven together, this very dramatic and emotional thing where she was, in a sense, showing this idea that when you see a young person, uh, you really should bless what you see, and that should take precedent over rules and things like that. And she did it right there in the classroom. So that was an early mentoring experience that I had. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know that yeah. there was a couple things, on, but that's okay. I, I think we'll be okay. With if I could make one. And how important it was and absolutely pivotal it could be in a young person's life to, s to have a young person intervene in a moment of shaming, mm -hmm. in a moment of abuse mm -hmm. of some kind. Yeah. Have one person say, you know what? This is wrong what's happening here. This is wrong. Whatever feelings you're feeling are justified and right. Mm -hmm. That that could shift a whole person's life, that it gives them an anchor yeah. from which to later go back and reformulate a new way of living, a new personality almost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that makes good sense. Yeah, and, 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 and telling that story, which I haven't thought of for, for a long time, 
um, the way that she revealed her struggle, what was so uh, moving and so endearing and so authentic. And I don't know how the other kids felt about it. I mean, it was just something that happened. I think everybody was shocked. But it was one of those things where you saw her and her struggle, and it made me as a child, as a kid, feel like, okay, you know, it's all right to be struggling. It's all right to make mistakes and all. Anyway, there was a lot of put in there that she contributed there. And um, so I think that has a lot to do with mentoring, that willingness to reveal oneself and to join the younger people in the struggle, you know, and then obviously to stand for something that's meaningful to that person or an insight and, and, to, and to just bless it. I felt, felt a little confused by that, but a little blessed by that, you know, so, so that was an early one. You know. Yeah, well, yeah, being blessed when one is not used to it is a very unfamiliar <laughs> experience. Yeah. I could testify to that. Yeah, and the fact that she could see this odd combination of wanting to learn and do well and still being intrigued with trouble and upsetting things and you know which is really how I was I didn't I didn't want to be a, a good kid I wanted to be a good student and other than that you know in the regular in the regular stuff and she found a way to make that okay which wasn't the case in other classes so do you feel like you had something akin to an initiate initiatory experience I mean were you well, in the military or I had a number of them, but I was in the military Terry, uh, during the Vietnam War, and um, the experience began before I went into the military, and it was definitely initiatory. It's what caused me to study initiation. When I got out, I had been drafted. I had gone to college, and I, right after I finished college, I got drafted. And this was early. This is 64. Uh, and um, so... <clears throat> I didn't want to go to that war, and I wrote him a letter back and said, you know, I don't think this is actually a declared war, and, and as far as the reasons for this military action, they don't seem very convincing to me, and so I don't think I'll come. I think I'll wait, and so if you have another one and it's a little more clear, you know, send me another message. Well, of course, I got a letter back from them rather quickly saying, either you come in at, for this hearing or, or you'll be arrested. So I went to the hearing, and, um, and I was thinking about it a lot. Um, and it's one of the things I know that young people do. They really take things seriously regardless of how they look and act. They're really considering. And I was really considering what was right in all of this. And I had this Catholic education that, uh, talked about what was right and wrong, and I thought this was wrong, what was happening. So I went down and I told them that. And then they said, well, then you must want to apply to be a conscientious objector. And they gave me this piece of paper, and I read it. And it said stuff like um, that for religious reasons um, and because I've always been opposed to violence and all this kind of stuff. And I said, you know, this doesn't exactly apply. I mean, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood. I couldn't claim that I have no interest in violence, and there's evidence to the contrary. And I said, so this isn't exactly right. I said, I'd like to write up my own. Can I do that? And they said, no. Either you s sign that and swear by that, or you go into... Anyway, I wound up in this either-or situation. I talked to everyone that I knew, and everyone that I knew said, you have to go. And so I wound up going. I kind of lost a little of my resolve, partly because everybody I knew said, no, you have to do this. So I went in, and uh, part of it I liked, actually. The boot camp was really interesting. It was energetic, and I was meeting people from all over the country and all different races and ethnic backgrounds and social backgrounds. I really liked it. Um, but when we went into, we went to Panama for uh, jungle training and preparation to go to Vietnam. And then they started to give this <clears throat> kind of instruction to kill and and, and, and how to um, just follow orders and all. And I was not good at that. I, didn't, I wasn't good at orders. And so, um, so I started to refuse to follow orders. You know, I would say, well, I'll follow this one, but this one I don't think is a very good order, so I'm going to, you know, I'm skipping that order. And, of course, they didn't like that at all. So I wound up getting court-martialed repeatedly. 
I was told before I left that I hold the U.S. Army record for court-martials. I don't know. But anyway, um, so I got uh, eventually uh, sentenced to, uh, to the military stockade, to the prison, the military prison. And um, as I like to tell people, I got there, and guess what? They give you lots of orders when you get there. And I said, hey, didn't you get the memo? That's the whole thing. I don't do orders, you know. Don't start that over again. That didn't go well at all. So I wound up in solitary confinement for a long time. And while I was in there, um, it became clear, actually, they, were, they told me they were preparing a case and that I was going to wind up in Leavenworth um, Federal Prison. And, and I realized this might go really badly. And it occurred to me to fast. So I stopped eating. And um, I couldn't explain what actually caused it. It just came to my mind, so I stopped eating. So I didn't eat for a very long time, several months. And I went from probably 150 pounds down to 87 pounds, and very close to death repeatedly. At least they would wake me up and tell me I almost died. Um, and they kept thinking that I was going to give this thing up, but something had happened inside me, and I had just realized, no, I wasn't going to, I neither wanted to live with the death or the blood on my hands of other people's lives for a reason that I, I could not understand or commit to, nor did I want to die in something like that, where the, my, my life and my death would be meaning, meaningless to me. So I realized I really had to stick this out. I couldn't explain it. It was just a, an act of conscience or something. And so eventually I got out. Uh, actually largely through Robert Kennedy, who was the uh, senator uh, of New York at the time. And one of the guards, I guess, somebody got a message to him saying that there's this guy from New York hidden away in Gorgas Hospital. I was in Panama uh, in the back of Gorgas Hospital that was built to treat illnesses and injuries while they were making the Panama Canal. There's a prison ward back there that hadn't been used in a long time, and I, I was back there under armed guard. And someone got that information to Kennedy, who called down there and said, you have one of my constituents in your jail, and if he's not out in 48 hours, I'll be there. That moved a whole lot of people. And so I wound up going home or getting out. And so here I am, 87 pounds, and uh, having this experience, which was radical and very solitary and um, without uh, an explanation. Yeah. Are you okay with water? Did you bring your own water? Or? I guess mm -hmm. I didn't. Oh, yeah, I did. I have a, I guess that, is that mine? Uh, I, I believe that is yours, yeah. Okay. okay. I'm fine for now. Okay. Great. So where were we? So he just <coughs> called down there. Oh, you yeah. just got down and you were 87 pounds. Yeah, so I came back, and, and, uh, and uh, actually on the way back, um, they flew me back. <clears throat> I was under armed guard all the time, and they flew me back handcuffed to two, uh, two guys uh, who were sergeants coming back from Vietnam. And, and actually, I think part of the plan was to put me in a bad position. And they told them that this is a guy that refuses to fight. And so I'm sitting on, on this plane, this army plane. And um, this was really interesting because they said to me, "Man, what happened to you?" But so they asked me what happened, and um, and I said I told them what ha what I, what happened. They said, "Wow, you've been fighting your own war." I thought they would say, you know, more of what I've been hearing was I was a coward and and, and I was a traitor. And they said, we've just been in war. And, and we think you've just been in your war. It was so great. And at, at the, we're on the plane, and other, other people came over to uh, vilify me. Because this was well known all through the area that someone was doing this. And they just they, they stood up. We, I had to stand up, too, because I was handcuffed to them. And they said, you know, we're the only armed people on this plane. And if you don't shut up, we're going to we're going to take care of you because this guy's with us. We're, we're coming back 
from being in country and he's been in his own battle and so back off who is so amazing I was surprised so they actually stayed with me when we got back because uh, it took a while to muster out as they call it and they stayed with me they didn't have to but uh, now their duty was finished but they stayed with me all the time and they became like my guards <laughs> or protectors and uh, so that was really healing and helpful to me and it made me realize that there was a really deep idea there that a person's, uh, what battle you pick to fight, that's what determines whether uh, you have courage or whether you fight the fight or not. Not the battle someone else gives you, but the one you pick. That, those guys really helped me. So I came back and I couldn't fit back in to the neighborhood. Um, I didn't fit in to begin with, but I sh sure couldn't fit back in. I couldn't explain what happened. Um, so, for some reason, I started studying anthropology as a way to try and understand it, and I started to find stories about initiation and rites of passage. That was the only sense I could make out of it, and it fit that pattern. And so, uh, so I've been studying that ever since, actually, and started to, th to think about how when a culture doesn't provide formal rites of passage or initiations, uh, people find their own, or they don't find them and never really find the traction of their life. Uh, so, so after, eventually I got to meet tribal people who have been through initiations and all and have done a, had a lot of conversations and done work with tribal people comparing this kind of informal experience with their more formal uh, initiations. So that's really, that is, was a formative experience for me but also got me really interested in what happens. Like I had to figure out why did I suddenly just decide I wasn't going to eat. And I was really trying to figure that out. That was really an odd thing. When right about then, there was a lot in the newspapers from Ireland about Bobby Sands and the uh, IRA guys who, in prison, had fasted against mistreatment. And I suddenly realized, this is an Irish thing. This is something that was in my blood or in my bones because I acted just like they did. And I researched that, and it turns out that in Ireland, when uh, people feel that there's an injustice and an imbalance of power and you can't defeat or correct it by force, that what they do is they fast against it. And so I then came to think that something ancient or old, ancestral, really had awakened in me and said that this is what I have to do. And um, so I felt really reassured by that and that led me into a whole other study of how uh, what I call the old mind, how ancestral or ancient images and ideas can live inside a person and under uh, critical pressure can awaken. Okay. Because I really felt that that's what that was. That was a kind of a Irish ancestral reaction. So that has been the cause of a lot of things I've studied. And it gives me a certain kind of... Um, hmm endurance when working with young people. You know, I'm not too often overwhelmed by what, what they bring or how, how much in trouble they are because uh, I go back to that experience of my own and think, yeah, well, something radical uh, has to happen to change people. So, so that's for me is initiatory. That's an amazing story. Makes me think of a couple of things. One is what a beautiful blessing those two men gave you on oh the yeah. plane, and uh, recognizing the fire that you had been through with someone of their own, and in effect yeah. blessing you. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. For going through it. Yeah. The other thing it makes me, it reminds me of is I, I was I was a teen in those same years. I'm about ten years younger than you, and I was a hippie against the war, and I was a total countercultural rebel. You know, this was sort of my cultural milieu. You know, and I was, you know, never going to go to war. I mean, I, this was just a firm, absolute in my own mind. Nonetheless, for years, I was mystified from my late teens through my twenties why I had this inexplicable urge to join the military, and I was came from an, as anti-military family as you can come from. And it was only years later that I began to understand that it's cellular level. Yeah. It's really biologically driven. My conviction mm -hmm. is this need for initiation. And yeah. I needed it desperately. 
Yeah. And I had nowhere to go yeah. to get it. And that's what it was about for me. I recognized that that's where I could possibly find it. Yeah. So and that's what that's happening to this day. Everybody, I think, knows at some level that initiation means life and death. It often feels like life or death, but it actually turns out to be life and death. And, uh, and that's one of the places where you know you can get it. I mean, so a lot, especially for young men, but for women and men to go to the military, to brush against danger, to, you know, catch this feeling of death and see if one survives and comes out as a new person. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the stripes and decorations of the military are stem from initiatory practices. In Africa, for instance, those stripes would be in the arm. And you could tell by touching someone's arm, the levels of their initiation used to be in the body, and now it's on the shirt. There is a connection to that, and um, and there, of course, is a longing for that. And it's in all the young people I see. It's in the colleges, but it's also in the street gangs, and it, it can't be removed. It's archetypal, as they say. And when a society or a culture doesn't attempt to create circumstances in which that can be worked on creatively, then you get usually destructive versions of it. And uh, yeah, and it's conflicted like that. That's, it's deep, mm -hmm. you know, I'm opposed to it and I could join it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where I was. I knew where my conscience was, but the pressure from everyone, family and neighborhood, was that I had to go there. And, uh, and um, for a while I was really stuck between those two places and then it became clear to me that I just had to stick with my own conscience, I guess I would call it. Yeah. Do you see initiation as being particularly essential now? Well, I, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, see, I think it's very hard to fashion initiations. I think it's really hard. Um, in uh, parts of Africa, what they say is, um, in order to grow a bigger life, a person has to brush against death. And some of the initiatory practices are severe enough that sometimes young people die, actually die. And so it seems to me that to shape one of those or fashion something like that is, gets pretty serious in the sense that um, there is, death is a possibility. And um, so I think it's very necessary now. For instance, I think our leadership, our cultural and political leadership really suffers because a lot of those who are elected to high positions would, I wouldn't say, are initiated into their own lives. And therefore, the decisions they make are often coming from the wrong place. And often they lack courage. I mean, that's something you really see in modern leaders, that they don't have the courage of their own convictions, you know, and, and, uh, and they don't know how you sacrifice uh, for something that's beyond your own interest, which is something that people used to learn from initiation. Um, so in that sense, I think it's extremely important. Uh, but I also think it's really difficult to fashion it that it, it has mostly disappeared around the world, uh, it, which is interesting. For something that's archetypal and that everybody has some understanding of an inkling towards, it has almost completely disappeared from tribal groups as well. I work with some tribal groups that are trying to reinstitute institute it, and it is extremely difficult to do it in an honest way. Uh, so yeah, I think it's very needed, and I also think that it's difficult to figure out how to do it. It's kind of like, if it isn't, it's like uh, cooking, which was one of the images that used to be used in, in South Sea Islands anyway, that the person is being cooked. And so um, I've heard people, modern people say, well, I, I'm initiating myself. Well, that goes against the whole idea because I, if I do it myself, I'm e either gonna have the temperature way too high or way too low. Um, but if someone else is regulating the heat, um, they also have to know how hot it can go and how much a person can take. And so I think that makes it really difficult uh, to just try it. So what I've been doing is trying to 
find circumstances or notice circumstances where someone's already in something initiatory. They're in such hot water that now you could bring the understanding to them rather than bring them in and try and create the right kind of hot water, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Because one of the functions of initiation is to bring the young people fully into the community. And so that implies that you have a community and that you have a community that understands the depth of the human psyche and the struggle to be meaningful in life. And so one of the problems I notice in working with young people, even if we're able to assist them to get to a deep place in their self, what do we do with them afterwards? It's, it's a serious problem because uh, often there's no community to deliver them to. So you wind up living with them or taking them home or, or trying to find a way to hold on to them. And so, um, so at least for now, what I've been doing is trying to bring initiatory ideas to where the trouble already is boiling. That's how I go about it because it seems to me a little less uh, dangerous in a way and it tries to avoid some of the inflation or could you, uh, to say, well, we're initiating young people, that would feel inflated to me, you know. Um, the other thing I learned early on if you're involved in someone's initiatory experiences, you become responsible to them. And, and the way I learned that is to this day, and even to yesterday, <laughs> I'm thinking of yesterday, I, I have uh, young people will call me when they're in trouble, and ones that I know for the most part. Sometimes I don't, but anyway. Uh, and even show up in my house or, or, or you know, and, and you have to give them time. You have to help them because some indelible bond has occurred. And so that has taught me that to be involved in someone's initiatory experiences means to take on a, a serious responsibility with regard to them and a long-term responsibility. And so that makes me cautious about uh, de trying to develop anything that's too grandiose because you wind up with responsibilities that are very hard to fulfill. So <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it might be a while before there are culturally appropriate forms of initiation. That's my thinking. You know, as much as it's needed, it's very hard to do it. And the people that I've seen trying it and, and so on, when you get right down to looking at what's happened and all, everybody has found it to be quite a difficult thing. Especially because. Um, what I like about initi initiation is the idea that there is a deep revelation of oneself to oneself. And to create the circumstances that allow that, because uh, it takes a certain amount of emotional pressure for that to happen, uh, is difficult, sometimes dangerous. And then you wind up with someone who needs a community to verify and sustain what they have just learned. And I find that difficult to do, how to create that. So I don't know that we're not in a, in a period of, of struggling with the knowledge of that and not readily finding forms. That's, that's my sense, anyway. I hope you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, I really do because, <clears throat> well, and in fact, the purpose of this film, in a sense, is to try to prove you wrong. Okay. <laughs> because one of, one of the things I want to do is film what are the forms, some of the forms of teenage yeah. initiation that are springing up in our country right now. And, uh, and I hear you. I yep. hear you, and I take it very seriously, this notion of grandiosity. You know, who the fuck are we to presume we can do it, you know? Yeah. That's a heavy, heavy burden to assume. Yeah. And yet, it's essential. Well, I think it's yeah. essential. Yeah. And then there's two parts. I mean, if you want to take initiation as rites of passage or uh, rituals for awakening, then there's two parts to it. I would say, two main parts. One is that there be some traditional form or some, some form or formality uh, that is known. Um, and the other is that it be radically open to change. So, in other words, I'm working with, let's say, a, a Native tribe, a, tr a traditional um, Native American tribe who has a living uh, initiatory tradition. They have it. They've been doing it. It hasn't been interrupted. It's been underground, but it's still been going on. The problem they have is the young people 
won't come and do it because they don't trust the older people because of what has happened uh, within the tribe and within the families. So they have a tradition, but it's not actually effective for the children they have. So in that case, what we have to do, from my opinion, is bring in some different approaches and different angles that create a bridge for uh, the children of the tribe, or the young people, to be willing to go and get involved with the older people in the tribe again. There needs to be an intermediary step. You can't just take the tradition and lay it on them because they actually already feel wounded by the tribe. So when I look at that, and, and to me it's an important thing because there's a living tradition, uh, one that goes all the way into the earth and has roots in that place and everything. Um, but what's missing in that case is the kind of element of change and the element of being really present and meeting the kids where they are. That's what seems to be missing there. Um, what is often missing when I see people trying to put, a get, put together a new form of initiation is the real tradition. They'll come up with a form, but it won't have enough root. It won't have enough anchoring into the ground, and it won't have enough resonance or uh, strength to hold what's happening to the kids. Doesn't the eldership, in effect, begin to guarantee that, though? I mean... Okay, well, possibly. But that means... Okay, so then you're down, because you bring in the elders. The elders have to be there to meet the spirit of the youth. Okay, but then you're, that, now you're down to what I consider anyway, the difficulty that whoever's playing the role of the initiators and the elders has to be willing to be really authentic in the situation. Now, this is a new difficulty because... Um, well, the kind of things that can come up are, are severe. Um, I, I mean, I, a few of them just went through my mind, but I can't even talk about them publicly. The things that can come up with a young person that need to be attended to, that cannot be shared in, in the general public because all kinds of things could happen. Um, uh, or um, uh, dangers that can arise. And one of the dangers is everybody pretending that something deep is happening if it's not happening. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm all in favor of the passage, and I'm all in favor of the having uh, initiators and elders there to do it, and I'm especially in favor of something genuine that just says, well, we thought this was going to happen, but it didn't work, and we're over here now, you know, if I'm making sense. Because mostly what I've seen is programs, yes. and, then I, and then I watch the kids not fully relate to the program, or I watch them go through it, and then they come out the other end, and it might have affected what in psychology would be called their ego, but it didn't get to their deep soul. And the whole purpose of initiation is to awaken and sustain the soul that's already there. And I think that's, it's hard for therapists to do it, and it's particularly hard uh, for uh, people that don't have a shared tradition to get there. I'm in favor of it. I'm just being cautious because of what I've seen. I hear that, and I respect that, um, and I think it's happening from what I can see. I mean, there's, uh, there's one group that comes right to mind called Boys to Men, and they went in with a program, and they ripped up the program in the course of the very first weekend, and they let themselves be guided, uh, leading by following, in a sense, from the young men or what mm -hmm. they needed. Mm -hmm. and. I mean, I know traditional logic says uninitiated men cannot initiate. This is what traditional logic tells us. But uh, I, I also feel like, you know, the West and the, how we live in the West calls for new forms of initiation. And, uh, you know, from what I've seen from the Mankind Project and Boys to Men places like this, I truly believe it's happening. Okay. And it's happening with the requisite shadow control and grandiosity control and self-checks and other things that really gives me tremendous hope that it's happening. The other thing that uh, I, I'm curious of, on your take on, because this is my belief too, and you sort of have said it, but I'd like to hear you say it more. <coughs> it needs to be culturally and spiritually specific, in a sense, to the background of the young person. 
ideally. So that, in other words, part of my intention with this film is I want to film, there's a guy in Colorado who's doing passage to manhood, okay? Christian. He takes kids and their fathers for a weekend and he tries to initiate them into manhood, basically, with a Christian t tradition. Frank Blasquez, I don't know if you turned me on to him, but I, uh, you might know I him. Know Frank, I know Frank, sure. He's taken the kids from the city of Chicago out to the reservation in South Dakota. Native American style initiation. Boys to Men is a non secular one. All traditions, all religious faiths are welcome, etc. I'd like to film a bar mitzvah where a rabbi is really imbuing the process with a kind of ritual intent and transformative intent that I believe it used to have. Well, I don't know. I'll say a number of things. Um, I don't think it's uh, open to film. I think the possibility of something, um, of, of things coming up that are uh, very private nature uh, has to be respected. I mean, that the process, it, uh, to me, a process that was directly documented with film um, might not get to the depth that is actually required to have a full awakening of the, you know, the inner life. Would no longer be sacred. Yeah, I think it interferes with the, the sacred quality that, uh, I think so. I think um, that the documents that are really valuable in the long term live inside a person. There's other ways to get at it, but to directly go at it, I think, can be a problem. I, I've never done that myself. I've never, and, and the Native people I work with wouldn't do that. Other things get filmed, but not that. Um, yeah, I don't want to just be against it because I, I share with you the realization of how deep the need is. What I'm doing, the way I'm approaching it, um, and I've studied it so since I was 24, you know, when I felt like I had to figure out my own experience. And the way I've been approaching it is young people always get themselves in trouble, almost always. And so once they're in trouble, then one of the main, main ingredients has occurred. That is to say, the pot's boiling hot. <laughs> and so uh, it seems more, I don't know what I would call that, legitimate to come in at that time and bring all the knowledge of these kind of things, both the traditional knowledge of, it, of rites of passage, the uh, anthropological knowledge of initiation, and the psychological knowledge uh, of um, the inner life, all to bear on that situation. Um, and the distinction between that and saying we're going to now take these young people and bring them through an initiatory thing, right now, for me, that's important. Um, because one of the first things I'm looking for is what is going to be the factor that's going to heat this thing up in a legitimate way. Um, you can use sweat lodges and things like that, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't kind of thing. Um, but anyway, that's how I've been approaching it. I don't know what the best way is, but that way I feel uh, more, s more safe. I don't know if it's safe the word. I worry about the integrity of things. If what's happening, if it's called initiation and it's initiating a movement in the soul of the young people involved, then how it's done it seems to me very important. If it actually works, because the initiation is going to go awry. In the traditional stories of many tribes, you find initiations, stories about initiations that go awry. Because the idea is that something awakens inside a person and it gets more fixed in them and, and more part of them. It integrates in them. And if what integrates, it's the same thing like in a sweat lodge. If you really do a serious sweat, you cook whatever you're carrying. And, if it, and you can cook a bad meal or a good meal, and then the person has to live with it for a while. And so for those reasons, I, I really feel cautious about what they're getting. So I don't know these things, but you say that someone doing a Christian process takes people, and now we're going to in initiate them for the weekend. I, I have trouble with that right off the bat. I say, well, that's presumptuous. It implies that the initiation could be done in a weekend, which would surprise me. It implies that somewhere in the course of this limited amount of time it's going to happen, 
and there's going to be time to reflect on it and complete the process. That's surprising to me. So I tend to go at it much more open. And we, I don't, we don't even call what we're doing initiation. Everybody I know that's doing that kind of work is studying initiation but not saying it <laughs> because that still le leaves it wide open for, for interpretation. And even the Native people that, that I have the good fortune to work with who have a living tradition that goes back into the mists of time um, or have become careful about what they're saying because of the reticence of the young people. So um, I, was, I was saying today when we were, everybody was together, we were talking about mentoring. Young people have a heightened sense of the inauthentic. And so that seems to me the first requirement for older people working with younger people is to make sure that what's happening is authentic. And so then if you combine that with the idea that, that you, what you don't want to do is harden something that's in the ego, to use the psychological terms, but actually loosen the ego and inspire and awaken and sustain what's happening deep inside in the soul or the deep self, um, then anything that prescribes it too much is likely to actually go more towards the ego. Not only that, it sets up the people that are doing it are really looking now for, uh, for an end result that proves their, their form. You know, and the whole, so, the, so there's an old distinction between fixed ceremony and radical ritual. Fixed ceremony, the steps are clear and the outcome is predictable. Radical ritual, only some of the steps are clear and the out, outcome is completely unpredictable. And I like the radical ritual part. You know, I like it a lot. Because, well, the way we do it is we say, we have three steps we're going to take and then we're going to be ready for whatever comes next. Uh, and, um, and, and no guarantee that we're going to wind up where we would like to be or hope to be. I mean, to me, that protects at least me from getting caught up in my own idea of what's happening. So that's how I, I go at it. I mean, everybody's got to try what they want. But, um, but it's, it's a powerful word, initiation. And psychologically speaking, it's an archetype. And so to claim it, um, at least in Jung's terms, would be perhaps to take on the mantle of the archetype too much. It's more like inviting the spirit of initiation to be present. And then, to me, sometimes you have to say, wow, you know, it didn't show up, or, or only a minor form of it came, <laughs> you know. So anyway, these, these are just the ways I go at it. I really respect that, and I, yeah. and I hear you loud and clear, and, I, and it's interesting because I think about how I've approached this film, and in a way, I've been looking for people who are using that term consciously, because for me, that was an important archetype to claim, however presumptuous maybe, and however yeah. dangerous, as you're saying, and because it seemed to me that it was an essential component in creating that um, depth of experience in a way. Um, but at, at any rate, I, I don't want to yeah. get caught up in this. I mean, you know, the, the work as I understand it is about doing that. It's about creating containers. It's about creating a cauldron and then calling forth the spirit and then hoping it shows up because that's really how I perceive and witness these, these things happening mm -hmm. is really at essence what is happening. It's not a prescription and there is all kinds of openness for individual expression and all kinds of things happening that nobody's foreseen. But to get back to this point, do you see that as a necessity in some way that there is a cultural tradition that a person is called back toward or I don't know back, if it's back or forward but uh, meaning what I was talking about before that um, that you know that, that this is a superficial way of saying it but that you know that an African-American kid in a sense might have an African flavored and uh, initiatory experience you know, a Jewish kid could have a, a bar mitzvah, whatever. Do you see that as being in any way important, or is that irrelevant? It's really... It can go either way. I mean, it's actually very complicated. There is no African. It, actually, Africa is so many different cultures 
you know, it's actually, when you get into it, it's actually complicated. And um, so on one hand, I could see value in that because it could, uh, you know, like we work with, uh, I was talking earlier and thinking about some of the Mexican-American kids we've worked with and how much they benefited from learning about Mayan culture and to learn that they actually have a background that has tremendous nobility. And, uh, and when they learn about the Mayan calendar, and, you know, and these are poor kids who have been treated as if they don't really belong here. And then they start to say, wait a minute, our people were here a long time ago. Maybe we really belong here. That's a beautiful thing to see, and that's really a strong thing for them. Uh, and so I see those kind of values, and I think that's really important. But I've worked with African people, and I've worked with African rituals in America. It's very hard to take a ritual form and transfer it to another place, including connecting it to the ground. I'll give an example. Uh, in parts of Africa, um, the part of the initiation includes uh, being buried up to your neck um, for, let's say, a 24-hour period or something like that. And the there's a lot of beautiful factors to it. The uh, people are buried at an angle like that, uh, and so you're, you're actually your whole body is encased in the earth, and, and your head is sticking up above. And uh, and, and I've, I've done it, because I wouldn't do something with someone else that I hadn't been through myself. And I found it to be a most, most amazing experience. Uh, and two of the amazing things are, one is you find out that the, the earth is moving very fast. You can't feel it while you're walking around. But as soon as you're immobilized in the earth, you realize you are hurtling through space. You can actually feel it. Uh, another thing is the earth seems to be giving messages. When your body is actually buried in the earth, the earth seems to be speaking in some fashion. And everybody seems to experience it differently. But it's a fantastic thing to do. But there's a small problem. Um, in West Africa, where this is done, I don't know for sure, but I think the temperature of the earth is probably up around 70 degrees. Uh, in North America, where it's been tried, the temperature is actually below 50, and you get hypothermia. Uh, you can often get have symptoms of it in five or six hours. So it was, to me, a really good example of how transplanting, so to speak, could really get people in trouble. So, so now we have a good idea, um, but we can't actually use it that way because our circumstances are so different. And so then you have to really go into intelligent invention to figure out what to do with things like that. So I don't know. I hear what you're saying, but I, I, I'm like that. I'm like paying attention to the complications. Like, um, so I, su I have myself. If, if I'm with a bunch of young African-American people, I'm more than likely will tell an African-American, an African story, but not always. Sometimes I would tell a story from a completely different culture because of the imagination or energy that's in the room. It will stir something else up. So uh, on one hand, I see the real value of that. On another hand, we live in odd circumstances with all kind of intermixed stuff. And so uh, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I try to just stay awake to what might work in this circumstance. And, um, hmm. I mean, I know a lot of African American groups that are doing rites of passage with their children, and, and they're using African heritage, and a lot of it is working. But everybody's having the same problem. Everybody I talk to is having the problem of relating to the young people where they're at, relating to them where they're at. A and trying to make sure that whatever the form is being used, that it isn't just uh, swallowing or it isn't, or, or, or it, it is actually getting people where they want to go. That's what I keep hearing everybody struggle with. Do you think rites of passage initiation is more important for boys than girls in some ways because of the biological difference? Not really. Uh, according to anthropologists, they have been able to find tribal groups there wh where there was no clear rite of passage for girls. But in the majority of studies, so they, have, they, they have, have found them. They have found those. But they claim to. But a lot of the early stuff that was done in terms of anthropological uh, excursions and so on like that, uh, I think what was happening was it was mostly men doing it, and they couldn't actually get access to what was happening with the women. It wouldn't be talked about. I think that's part of it. Um, and then what happens with the women is so different, and it can, and it tends to be, uh, in in many ways, more private. One reason it's private is it's usually done one at a time, 
since the onset is the menses occurring, the, the awakening of the body, and it's, it's being tied to the cycles of the moon, and it has to be dealt with right away. And so when the girl goes into her menses, that's her body saying we're now going to initiation. So she goes, they have, the women have to take her then. The boys don't have that overt sign, so the boys are taken in a group. So one of the ways I think of it as, um, the boys begin um, as a group, and the initiation teaches them that they are a unique individual. That's kind of what happens. And the girls begin as a unique individual and get woven into the sisterhood and the group of the women. That's just an interesting way to think about it. So it's, it's not a matter of what's more important or, or, or which is important. It's a matter of how it's important. Um, one of the problems, I work with girls as well as boys. I work with anybody. If, if young people are having trouble and I can help, I'll try and do it. And, and so we do this project, Voices of Youth, and I think it's had uh, possibly more girls than boys, a little bit more. That's what someone told me. Uh, sometimes we work with them all together. But um, one of the things I've heard from the girls, and, and, I've, and, w and when we're working with the girls, there are women involved, because women know things you know, uh, about girls that men don't, and certain things are better between the girls and the women. But one of the things that the girls and the women have talked to me about is how they don't feel fully a part of things, how there is some kind of, there's something that has happened in the culture, they call it patriarchal and all that, whatever all that is, but where the women don't feel welcome and they have a hard time welcoming the girls. So I've studied a lot of the literature on initiation of girls and it's extremely beautiful and it's very interesting and rich. And so I think it's terribly important. A and here's one way to think about it. The girl is, most girls are going to become a, a women and a high percentage of them will have children. And if the woman doesn't feel initiated into her own life and into being grounded in the world, she's then going to have children and have difficulty dealing with that. So I think that there was a, a focus on the initiation of women in a lot of tribal groups and I think it was understood uh, to be very important for the making uh, the next generation, that the women also be, be initiated. But what happens with boys, if they aren't pulled into a meaningful process, they become outwardly very destructive. And so everybody begins to pay attention to that because they form gangs, they get violent, and they cause trouble. But I've been with an awful lot of girls who are destructive inwardly, who are cutting themselves, who are overeating, who are depressive and hiding out. And that actually takes something away from culture too. It's just not as blatant, but there's a big loss there because I think it's natural to want to see the vibrancy and the beauty of, of girls as well as boys. And I think a healthy culture thrives on, on the exhibition and the display and the giving of that vitality and that beauty. And I think there's something really lost, but it's more subtle. The boys are going to really stick it in everybody's face, typically. But the girls are actually losing something as well. And when the girls don't feel fully invited into life, they tend to hook up with boys that are going to be harmful to them or destructive to them. There's a really beautiful uh, uh, ritual in a certain tribe in Africa where after the, her initiation, the girl comes back to the village and the women have made with her a belt of uh, shells and beads which she wears over her belly and abdomen. And, and the idea is she's presented to the whole tribe uh, covered in these beads and the beads are connected to the entire tradition of the tribe the bead memories the the shell memories and it's like saying that she's noble in her belly and in her generative organs and she stands before the tribe with uh, one hand going down to the earth and one hand holding up and I, I don't I forget exactly how it goes but someone explains that this hand anchors her into mother earth and this hand ties her into father sky and this shows how she's protected by all of the old traditions. And the idea is for the whole tribe to understand you have to respect this girl who now has become a woman and that it's up to her whether she keeps this girdle on or takes it off. And, she's t and you better pay attention because she's tied into the, the world above and the world below as well. And I think those things are missing too and really important because when that's not seen, people don't see the value of that girl and they don't see the respect that has to be had for the feminine. And so even 
those who are working mostly with boys, if that doesn't happen, the boys don't know how to respect the presence of the feminine. And so I think the things used to go together. I think they used to go together. There's another tribe that has a thing called the Muji tree. And the Muji tree uh, is the place where the boys are initiated and the place where the girls are initiated. And the tree is considered to be the symbol of both. It's phallic and standing upright uh, like a masculine thing. But inside it, there is a womb in there and, uh, and so on. So it's considered to be both the image of the feminine and the masculine, and they're both initiated at the same tree at different times. So there's lots of stuff out there. And, um, and I like the ones that tend towards weaving it all back, all back together. So anyway, these are just thoughts I have about it. <laughs> Which I love, beautiful thought. I see mentoring and, and I, initiation as two halves of the, the same whole. Mm -hmm. Do you have a similar understanding of it, or how, how do you see the two connected? Well, I think you can have um, different forms of mentoring. Um, uh, there's a form that I call survival mentoring, where what happens is, and I think mostly of young people, they're struggling so hard that you just have to go in and help them survive. And you do whatever's necessary. You bring whatever resources are necessary. You provide protection and, uh, and support. And um, sometimes that doesn't involve anything that's ter terribly initiatory. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of the protective, just make sure they stay alive thing. Then I've, I've seen forms of mentoring which stays a little bit general a little bit general. And it's like um, uh, we're helping them with their life skills, we're helping them with their, um, maybe their ethics, we're helping them with their um, awareness of themselves. And, and, uh, and it's not aimed at getting to the full depth and, and the awakening of the self or the soul. So then that's the third form, I guess, I think, is the attempt to really involve in the initiatory awakening of what they came here to do, what they came to life to do. And I've, I've, those other things happen, and, and at times there, I think they're important. Um, but in its depth, I think mentoring is about the spirit inside, both the mentor and the pupil or the student. Um, and I also think that the old idea of learning, learning was a sacred activity. I think the root of the word learning, the root meaning is to sing over. And I think there's a, a singing over the souls of the young that mentors get involved with. And so I like the kind of mentoring that's involved with initiation. And I think if, if genuine mentoring is going on, the young people will have initiatory experiences. So actually maybe that's the way I'm angling it. You know, I, I know people, and, and someone spoke today about being taught guitar by real masters and having an initiatory experience. And I think that's legitimate, that initiation involves arts and artful things, and it can happen that way. And um, so I think there are many roads of it, and I think mentors, when they work with their own depths and the depths of young people, stumble into initiatory experiences and events. And maybe that's the form I'm going with. Um, so yeah, I think there's a deep connection. And then I think of mentoring as practice eldering. I think of it as, uh, there's again, as a tribe that I studied that uh, talked about the practice elders. And I love that idea. And it struck me that they were talking about mentoring. That you bring in the practice being an elder by being involved in the lives of others and trying to foster depth and meaning and, and uh, real values in those other lives. So I think that is a natural connection, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful concept. I, I really love that. Um, one of the things you, you touched on today um, is the, the, the proximity, as you put it, between the gift and the wound. Sure. My understanding has always been the gift comes out of the wound. Yeah. I mean, that it's not even close. It's the same, in a sense. Mm -hmm that whatever it is that has seriously wounded a person 
and because it's late in the day, I can't get into the, the explanation, but alchemically, magically, yeah. somehow becomes what it is that they're called on to give as a gift to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, like, I distinguish them when I talk about them because I just watch people struggle with it so much. And so I think there's a, a value in distinguishing two things. And I, I just, I say they reside near each other. And so then to me, well, this goes back to the idea of someone learning the guitar or, or any instrument, that if you take the gifted part of a person and they're playing an instrument because that's part of their gift, then that's one way to work with their soul issues. Um, a lot of initiatory practices go right after the wound, right into the wounded area. Um, and so, again, you see this, those two possible ways of going. And, and what happens when you're doing the gift approach, so you have someone that has a particular talent and, a, and they've developed it and they have skill and they have mastery, the students that come to them could be boys and could be girls. They're coming because they have a similar gift, because they have a similar uh, talent and skill. And so that's another way to see how it could happen on that side and how it would be different than the tribal idea that you take the boys off and you take the girls off. So maybe that's what I've done is start to see that. And so I think I was mentioning we have in, in the project we do, call, we call Voices of Youth, um, it's girls and boys. And, um, and we're trying to get at the, all of their gifts and we're trying to get them to express themselves and give something of their innate, innate inherent gifts. But then it turns out there are some things that are best to do with the boys separate. There's some ways you can get deeper faster. The language simplifies. You can get across what you mean. You can hear what they mean. And there's some issues that are best dealt with that way, violence being one of them. Then it turns out the girls, some things are best if they're going to do that with the women. Again, language simplifies. If you're with boys and girls, women and men, and you say a certain word, it can have different meanings. When you separate the genders, you can get a, a, a more simplified understanding of what's being said, and you can move along, and you can get to some depth. And so I think both separate um, experiences and joint experiences are part of it. And, and especially if the point is eventually to have young men and young women who are able to express themselves and know that they're valuable and have some idea what they're on this worth to do and what they have to give, then it seems to me that some of that will be accomplished separately and some of it will be accomplished together. Th that's how I'm currently going with it anyway. That brings up for me the issue of blessing and mm -hmm. acknowledgement. And that's a beautiful entry point, I mean, is to, to see the gold mm -hmm. in a young person to see the gifts, to see, as they call it in Folsom Prison, where I do work, the medicine, mm -hmm. the medicine that each person has to yeah. offer, and acknowledge it, you know. Yeah. Uh, talk about that and the importance of that. Well, the medicine uh, comes, that's a usually Native American concept, that everybody's born with medicine. And of course, it's a very smart idea because as soon as you hear medicine, it implies you have to give it to someone. You know, first of all, it's going to help other people. That's what medicine is usually for. It's for oneself, but also someone else could have it, need of medicine. So that's nice. It also immediately implies healing. And that goes with another old idea that says anyone who gets to be an elder is also a healer. Women are men. Uh, women are men. Anyone who lives long enough to extract the knowledge from their own life is automatically a healer. So that's different than the idea. Now, you may have people who are gifted healers. That's one thing. But every elder is supposed to be a healer, a healer, and that comes up with the word medicine. Uh, the other way you go at it is, say, gifts, the inherent and natural gifts. And the idea is that people don't em enter the world empty, that everybody enters with something already in their soul. And that might seem like a simple statement, but that's a serious argument in Western culture because um, Christianity, actually through the Catholic Church early on, came up with the idea of the tabula rasa, which means the table scraped clean. And, they, and the idea was that the soul enters the world clean. And then life uh, and how they are treated determines their nature. And that goes against all the old traditions, which said that everybody has an inner nature or a second nature that already has characteristics that will determine that person's 
uh, longings and that person's values. And I love that idea. I think it's way more important. And one reason why is it means that every child that comes is valuable because they already have a gift. They already have something to give. And so tribal cultures, um, not to idealize them because they had their own problems, but they did have the understanding that each person came to give gifts. And the idea of a culture was to make gift givers, not to create consumers. The exact opposite of the modern idea that everybody's empty and has to consume. And so I think the interest in initiation is also an interest in that. If someone's going to attempt initiation, study it, whatever, fool around with it, whatever they're doing, I do think it means that they're interested in their own gifts and they're interested in the gifts in young people. And so philosophically, that means they're already arguing with the cultural ideal idea, which says that everybody's empty and that you're formed by experience, which is usually called social determinism. Under social determinism, you can say certain groups of people aren't valuable because they have been proven to act a certain way and they'll act that way again. And certain people, because their family went to jail, you know, all that kind of stuff that people do is against the idea that each soul is unique and valuable. And so maybe a place where I am lately is anybody that's doing anything that recognizes and blesses the unique inherent qualities of young people probably is doing some good, <laughs> you know, because the general cultural atmosphere is to deny that. And that creates a, an unnecessary wound in young people. Young people don't feel welcome. And, um, and the only way they can, you can't feel welcome generally. In other words, uh, I remember someone once saying to a whole group of young people, boy, you're all so great. And, and one girl raised their hand and said, and which way am I great? <laughs> <laughs> in other words, it's, they don't want to know we're all great. They want to know, did you see me? And so um, I guess anything that's doing that, I would be, you know, I, I would imagine is doing some good, you know. And then it's very hard to genuinely recognize and bless the qualities of another if a person hasn't found some in themselves. And so the act of doing it for the benefit of someone else, I think, does polish one's own gifts and, and reminds us that, we're, that we have a welcome in the world as well. And so that's another value of, of mentoring, I guess. Well, it's a way of guaranteeing you're doing your own work, yeah. basically. You, you can't do it, as you said, without being authentic and yeah. looking in the mirror all the time. Yeah. You know, what, what am I doing that's, that's making me respond to this person in such a way, you know? Yeah. And that's a good way to test you know, a program or whatever it is that people are attempting, test it. Are, are, are those who are doing it, are they, are they is, is it polishing their gifts? Uh, and I, I have to say, the, the two tendencies in modern culture that are automatically are problematic. One is the great tendency to ascend, to have success, to get up and above, and to be seen in powerful and, and, and washed in light ways. It's a really a problem. You had mentioned alchemy earlier, and one of the key movements in alchemy is circulatio. And part of what it means is that uh, people ascend and descend, ascend and descend, and that's what makes the soul. And so that's what makes it rich and round and full. And even if you think of some, something like Buddhism, you have the Hinayana and the Mahayana. And the Hinayana, or the lower road, it's called the lower road, is about transcending and into enlightenment in one's own life, end of story. The Mahayana is about going all the way to the height of um, uh, enlightenment and then returning to work with everybody else. And so I was worried about in, in modern cultures the uh, uh, ascension only to the level of the Hinayana, ascending for oneself and the people one is involved with and not remembering that you go up and you go down and, and the up is to come back and go down and work with the, where the suffering is in oneself and in others. And so that's where a little my, my hesitation about how group, uh, groups approach this stuff goes. Uh, another way to say it is some kind of system that checks and, and makes sure that it's not just the building up of the ego qualities of the group, whether it be the young people and or the mentors, something that checks that it's still getting down and getting to the 
essence of things. And not to fault a particular group, this is the atmosphere that we live in. That, um, and there's this tremendous tendency to try and prove we were successful and that kind of stuff, you know. It's very common. But um, again, in alchemy, the idea was the opus, the work of a whole life. And so in working with the young person, I like to imagine what we're doing now may be temporary, but hopefully it seeds something that can work in their whole life. And we won't even be around to see it, you know. We won't even be there. But that's the attempt, is to, is to do that. Um, anyway, those, those, again, are thoughts I have about it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I wondered if you would recount for me this beautiful little story you told about the mentor showing up at the door. <laughs> I was so touched by that story. I thought I'd I'd love to have this if you yeah. want to share it. Well, that ha uh, someone just told me the story. I was doing a uh, a workshop uh, for people that wanted to work with mentoring, and she told this story, you know. And of course, I'm a storyteller, so I can't guarantee I'm giving exactly what she told. It probably has embellished in my mind some. That's what happens actually to storytellers, but. Um, I like to tell it because of the quality of showing up and it has some of the humility that's required and it has some of the the unknown that intrigues me so a woman takes a job um, with the mentoring project and, and she's assigned to someone as they typically do and uh, and she has to go to the house of this girl and um, she goes and knocks on the door for her first mentoring meeting, one hour a week it's supposed to be or something, and uh, no one answers the door, but she senses someone in there, so she waits around. Uh, no one ever answers the door, so she leaves. She comes back the next week and puts in her hour, knocks on the door. She thinks there's someone there. They don't come, she stays. Um, so week after week, she visits and she begins to call it mentoring the door where she just knocks and hangs out by the door and then the period for which she agreed to do it is over and it's the end of the project and she goes on and uh, years later several years later she gets a letter from the, a girl who says uh, I was on the other side of the door and now I'm in college and I want you to know that I was so depressed and I was in such pain that I couldn't open the door. I couldn't bear to be seen. But every week I waited for you to show up and knock on the door. And the fact that you came and stood outside the door is probably what kept me alive. And I want you to know I'm in college and I'm doing well and here's what I'm studying. So, very beautiful. And so there's a delicate initiatory thing. And imagine, she never saw her student. She never saw her pupil. Um, and she stood by herself, and her willingness to be there became the initiatory uh, factor. And, um, and the delicacy of that and the unknown of it and, and the lack of uh, detail in it uh, helps me when I think about initiation stuff because there is a tendency for people to say, this is it, we're doing this, everybody has to do this, we're going to do this now, everybody jumps in the water now, everybody turn to your left, and we do a four directions, you know. Here's a woman standing on a porch, never even know who she's trying to talk to, and never hears a word or sees anything, and yet it changed that young woman's life, maybe saved her life. And so those things make me try to get a more subtle eye for what's happening. Yeah, that's a good mentoring story, and it has that quality of showing up, showing up, because that's a lot of what young people don't see, not enough showing up for them. And... Um, it also has in it the idea that you, you do something and you don't know the result. And again, for me, that is often how it goes, that you make your attempt and you don't know what happens and you find out later. So, I love that story and, and part of what's beautiful about it to me is I wonder what the mentor gets too. Yeah. Because as you so rightly pointed out today, if you're not getting something out of this, yeah. you're doing you're not doing what you should be doing. Yeah. You, know, you have to be invested in it. You have to be personally getting something. So whatever lessons in humility or patience yeah. Yeah. or awareness she was getting, that's part of what goes through my mind too. Yeah, something must have been happening to her on the porch or she couldn't have just so dutifully come back. 
And so we don't know. She didn't mention that. She just told this anecdote. And then, of course, what she was clear about was a few years later, she got a reward and went, wow, isn't that amazing? And then she didn't say, but she said it, it was a lot of emotion when she told it. And I'm guessing that the news came to her at a time when she might have needed it, that it really came into her life in a good way. And, um, but yeah, she hopefully was getting something out of it. And that also goes back to, you know, when you, when you talk about trying to fashion an initiation, some conscious conversation with those that are doing it. What are we getting out of this? Where are we with this? When we work with, with young people, uh, when we finish, we have uh, later at night very intense meetings with the folks that are doing the work about what came up and what's going on and where is everybody at and uh, sharing of information, but also uh, careful looking at what everybody did and where, you know, how are we doing and, and what the dangers might be. So there's a whole mentoring process going on separate from the work with the young people, which I think is important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the Mankind Project work that we do, we're constantly processing ourselves behind the scenes. Oh, that's good. To make sure, oh yeah, that we're clean and we're there in service. And, and we're not dragging our own shit along with it. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely essential. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you forever, <laughs> but I, I need to let you go, I, I know. Yeah. So.